Muy buenas tardes. Eh, los invitamos a todos a tomar asiento para dar comienzo al, al seminario. Aprovecho de informar que luego que termine el, el seminario, al final, eh, hay un café, un pequeño café para quienes quieran entonces, a compartir un minuto eh, a la salida de la, bueno, del pasillo. Así que, bueno, si es al principio, pero por razones de tiempo del partido, se tuvo que buscar cómo sale en el programa y vienen en la carpeta. Señoras, señores, estudiantes, profesores, muy buenas tardes. Damos a todos ustedes la más cordial bienvenida al primer ciclo de seminarios de Derecho Privado organizado por los estudiantes del Congreso Estudiantil de Derecho Civil de la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de Chile. El presente ciclo de seminarios se presenta como un proyecto elaborado por estudiantes de esta facultad con el objetivo de abordar crítica y analíticamente distintas materias de derecho privado. En esta ocasión se pretende provocar el debate en torno a la distinción entre el contrato y las relaciones fiduciarias. En el nombre de la Coordinación General del Congreso, agradecemos a todos quienes han hecho posible su realización, la que hemos materializado en el día de hoy. Agradecemos especialmente a nuestros auspiciadores y patrocinadores, a un de Pinto Abogados, y al Departamento de Derecho Privado de la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de Chile. En esta jornada, contamos con la presencia de destacados expositores, a quienes agradecemos haber aceptado también nuestra invitación. El profesor Daniel Markowitz es profesor Guido Calabresi en la Escuela de Derecho de la Universidad de Yale, Estados Unidos. Su trabajo se ha centrado en los fundamentos filosóficos del derecho privado, filosofía moral y política, como también en la economía conductual. Es bachelor en matemática por la Universidad de Yale, máster en econometría y economía matemática en London School of Economics, doctorado en la Universidad de Oxford y Juris Doctor en la Universidad de Yale. Es profesor Enrique Barros, es profesor de Derecho Civil en la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de Chile, doctor en Derecho Summa Cum Laude en la, en la Universidad de München, miembro del número del Instituto de Chile, miembro de la Comisión de Reformas a la Constitución abogado integrante de la Corte Suprema entre los años 2000 y 2006, presidente del Colegio de Abogados de Chile entre los años 2007 y 2011 y consejero del Centro de Estudios Públicos. Iniciaremos en la jornada del día de hoy con la presentación del profesor Daniel Marcos. Muchas gracias. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to speak in, in English and so I apologize for that. I, I will try to understand in Spanish. But first of all, I also just want to thank Francisco for everything and all the other students who have been unimaginably generous and attentive hosts while I've been here. And I'm grateful, but I'm also, honestly, immensely impressed. <laughs> It's not easy to do that, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I also want to thank all of you for coming out, especially tonight. In, in 1984, when Walter Mondale became the Democratic candidate to run against Ronald Reagan for the presidency of the United States, Reagan was asked whether he was going to watch Mondale's acceptance speech of the Democratic nomination. And Reagan said, it depends on what else is on. And tonight, as we all can see, the, there's an enormous amount else on. And it seems almost, almost wrong to have a seminar on private law and private law theory in the face of this kind of public celebration. Uh, but maybe it's a sign that we're serious people. So uh, I'm grateful to you for being here. I thought what I'd do is I would start just by outlining some of the main ideas of the paper. I think the paper has been circulated, is that right? But I will outline the ideas in a slightly different way that might be helpful, especially I think since I, I take it many of you are students. And so it might make sense uh, just to go through some of the common law principles that lie at the back of this argument. I was going to use a blackboard, but we don't have one, so I'm going to type, and then we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right, well, I may or may not. There we go. Okay, even better. <laughs> All right, so just, just start by talking about the expectation remedy and the theory of efficient breach. Um, how many of you have 
encountered the theory of efficient breach in your studies at this point. Okay, so it's good that I'm going through it. All right? Imagine that a seller wants to sell a car to a buyer. To a buyer, all right? Now, we're going to assume that the price is $10,000. Okay? And the value of the buyer, we're going to assume, is $9,500. Okay? In other words, the buyer is made $500 better off by buying this car. Now suppose that a second buyer appears. We'll call this person off the tab so you can have everything on the same page. This person is going to be called buyer two. Now there are two possibilities for buyer two. The first is that the valuation of buyer two <coughs> equals $10,500. The second possibility is that the valuation of buyer two equals nine thousand dollars. Sorry, I'm now if you think that the law should be arranged to promote efficiency. What you mean by that, roughly speaking, is that the legal rule should be such that goods end up in the hands of the people who value them the most. <clears throat> that means that if the buyer, too, has a valuation of $10,500, you think that the seller should deal with buyer, two rather than buyer. Because buyer, two values the car $500 more, sorry, $1,000 more than buyer, one. On the other hand, if buyer two turns out to value the car at only $9,000, the seller should deliver the car to buyer one because buyer one values the car at $9,500, which is $500 more. Now, if transactions costs are zero, by which I mean if it doesn't cost the parties anything to shift the car amongst themselves and make new arrangements, it doesn't matter what the legal rule is. Because when transactions costs are zero, goods flow uphill in the same way in which water flows downhill. They always pass from somebody who values them less to somebody who values them more. Imagine that buyer one and buyer two can costlessly buy and sell the car between themselves. And imagine that for some reason, the seller delivers the car to buyer one, even though buyer two values it at $10,500. What's the next thing that will happen? Buyer one will go to buyer two, and say, hey, how much will you give me for the car? And buyer two will answer a price that is greater than $9,500, and the car will go to buyer two. Now imagine, on the other hand, that buyer two values the car at only $9,000, and the seller, for some reason, it doesn't matter why at the moment, delivers the car to buyer two rather than to buyer one. What will happen now is that buyer two will go to buyer one and say, hey, well, how much will you give me for the car? And buyer one will say some amount between $9,000 and $9,500 and the car will again go to buyer one. So if transactions costs are zero, it doesn't matter what the law is. The parties will keep trading and keep dealing until the person who values things the most highly has them. But of course, in the real world, transactions costs are not zero. And one of the reasons why I used a car as the example here <clears throat> is that how many of you have bought and sold cars before? No? Well, if you had, you would know that the transactions costs of buying a car are high. In particular, they're higher than $500. You have to register the car. You have to insure the car. You have to pay a sales tax on the car. You have to test the car to make sure it's not a bad car and you're not being cheated. For all these reasons, you would gladly pay more than $500 in order not to have to buy a car, but just to have a car. All right? So in the real world, the car will stay where the seller puts it. And if you think that the purpose of contract law, or the purpose of private law generally, is to promote the interests of the parties, 
then this is a reason, all else equal, to pick a legal remedy rule that will cause the seller to deliver the car to buyer one whenever buyer one values the car more highly than buyer two. Or if buyer two values the car more highly, to breach her contract, so to speak, and deliver the car to buyer two. The expectation remedy, which is the preferred remedy for breach of contract at common law, but not at civil law, which is defined as valuation of buyer one minus the price. In other words, the expectation remedy makes the first buyer indifferent between performance of the contract and breach plus damages. Does everybody see that? The expectation remedy has the property that it and it alone induces the seller to breach the contract when and only when the second buyer values the car more highly than the first buyer. Using these numbers, you can just convince yourself in your head, imagine that the remedy is not the expectation remedy, but five times the expectation remedy. The expectation remedy in this case, sorry, I have done a typo. <clears throat> the expectation remedy in this case is $500 the value of the buyer minus the price. If the, if the remedy were five times the expectation, that would be $2,500. Buyer two could not afford to pay $2,500 more than buyer one, because buyer two doesn't value the car highly enough. And so the seller would fail to breach, even though buyer two valuing the car at $11,000 should get the car. On the other hand, if the remedy were much lower than the expectation remedy, it could turn out that buyer two, even though she values the car at only $9,000, could still afford to pay enough so that the seller will breach and deliver the car to buyer two. The expectation remedy has the property that the seller breaches when and only when it's efficient for her to do so. All right? Now, here's some things I'd like to think through concerning this setup. First point, many people say that a problem with the expectation remedy is that it rewards the seller for doing the wrong thing. The seller has made a promise, the seller breaches, and the seller gets to keep all the gains <coughs> from the breach. I'd like to persuade you that that's just not true. It's not that it's just not true because I have a peculiar view about morality. It's just not true because if you think through who gets to keep what, it turns out that the seller doesn't get to keep all the gains. When the parties make a contract, they make a contract because they expect to trade. They expect that the buyer's valuation will be higher than the seller's costs. But it can always happen that the seller's costs will go up. One way in which the seller's costs can go up is her opportunity costs can go up, as happens when somebody who values the car at $11,000 shows up. When that happens, the parties know that they will be better off collectively if they don't trade. If the seller trades in circumstances in which her costs exceed the buyer's valuation, the trade loses money. And so the seller and buyer know that they would rather not trade in circumstances in which trade is inefficient. A contract that gives the seller the right not to trade when trade is inefficient will cost the buyer less. The price will be lower when the remedy is the expectation remedy <clears throat> than when the remedy, say, is specific performance. If you want a completely intuitive version of this, think about the following. You go, you go to the finest hat store in Santiago and you buy a hat. Probably one feature of this hat store is that if the hat 
falls apart the first time it rains. They don't just give you their, your money back or your expectation remedy. They probably, because they're that kind of store, will give you a replacement hat. They'll give you specific performance. Now imagine, on the other hand, that you go out into that party over there and you buy one of those hats. <laughs> All right? And it rains, and the first time it rains, the glue dissolves and the hat falls apart, and you go back to the seller and you say, hey, I want a remedy. You sold me a defective hat. The person would think you were insane. Because one of the things that you buy when you buy a hat is you buy the remedy. And in the fancy hat store, you buy a really generous remedy. And from the seller on the street, you buy no remedy at all. And that's understood by all the parties. And one of the reasons that hat can be so cheap is that it doesn't come with any remedy. If it had to come with a remedy, it would have to be more expensive. All right? But notice what happens when the price goes down. Notice what happens when the price goes down. The valuation of the buyer stays constant. If the price goes down, what happens to the expectation remedy? It goes up. All right? So because the price has gone down, the expectation remedy goes up, which means that when the seller breaches efficiently, she has to transfer more money to the buyer than she would have had to transfer if she didn't have that right, because the price has gone down. And in that way, the buyer captures some part of the gain from the breach. All right. Notice I said nothing at all about what promise and morality is, or pacta sunt servanda, or whether you have to keep or not. I've just said let's look, let's think instrumentally what's going on here. Under the efficient breach regime with the expectation remedy, both the seller and the buyer get some of the gain when the seller breaches. That's one point. <clears throat> now here's the second point. Another objection that lawyers often make to the expectation remedy. And it has nothing to do with the morality of promise. It goes like this. When the law recognizes a contract, it recognizes an obligation to perform that contract. When the law gives the expectation <coughs> remedy as the only remedy for breach, it encourages sellers to breach. This has nothing to do with fairness between the parties. This is just an argument of the sort of internal logical or normative consistency of the law. And it's inconsistent, people would say, for the law both to assert that a seller has an obligation to perform and to <coughs> encourage the seller to breach. <coughs> that's not, it's not that it's immoral, it's just nonsense, people might say. That's also not true. And one doesn't need to have any sophisticated views about the structure of contract law to see that. All one has to see is the following. Everything I've just said about the incentives is, of course, something the parties can understand when they're making their contract. And so the parties, they can look through this, and they can see that they're going to make a contract, and that sometimes the seller is going to want to breach. And sometimes the buyer is going to be made better off if the seller can breach when she wants to. And a lower price will result. And so when the parties make a contract with the expectation remedy and the lower price, what they're in fact doing is they're <coughs> agreeing that the seller is allowed to breach as long as she pays the expectation remedy. Now let's imagine a contract that has the following form. It's a take or pay contract. <coughs> The contract in which the seller says, either I will deliver you your hat or I will pay you $25. And when the time comes, the seller decides she wants to pay the $25. Nobody would think that seller had breached. What that seller had done is chosen one form of performance from a contract that permitted her to choose among two different kinds of performance. But of course, the ordinary contract with the price term is substantively equivalent to this contract. The price term just says, seller, if you don't deliver the goods, you have to pay a sum of money equal to the difference between the buyer's valuation and the price. That's just a long-winded way of saying, seller, you have a choice between delivering the goods and paying $25. So a seller who doesn't deliver the goods, who doesn't deliver the car, but instead pays the expectation remedy voluntarily, isn't breaching at all. He's performing. 
And a, a court that orders the expectation remedy is not ordering money damages to substitute for performance. It's ordering specific performance of a contract. It's just choosing which performance term specifically to enforce. So on this view, efficient breaches don't exist. They're a myth, as Alan Schwartz and I say in another article. And the only remedy for breach of contract is specific performance. The law, the common law, talks about expectation damages just because it turns out that the most efficient contracts are ones that give the seller a choice between trading and transferring a sum of money equal to the expectation remedy. And the law helps the parties reduce drafting costs <coughs> by filling that in as a default term. The common law now is not actually materially different from the civil law. In the civil law, the standard remedy for breach of contract is specific performance. In the civil, in civil law legal systems, sophisticated commercial parties write liquidated damages clauses into their contracts regularly. So what do you have? You have a regime of specific performance, but in fact, often the specific performance is paying money. In common law, formally understood, the only remedy for breach of contract is specific performance. Sophisticated parties use, that, use liquidated damages clauses. Unsophisticated parties use the default liquidated damages clause provided by the expectation remedy. The usual way in which sellers compensate buyers when they breach is by paying money, but that money is in fact in order of specific performance. And there is all the difference in the world between a seller who refuses to deliver the goods but voluntarily pays the money. That seller is not breaching and a seller who refuses both to deliver the goods and to pay the money, that seller is breaching, and a court can come in and order specific performance of the contract. Now, why have I gone through this in introducing a paper that has nothing to do with contract law, <laughs> <laughs> but has instead to do with fiduciary law? Here's the reason. Notice a feature of this remedial structure it leaves the question what to do, whether to transfer the good, sorry, whether to trade the good or to transfer to the money, unilaterally up to the seller. And it creates a set of incentives so that the seller will make that choice unilaterally, but efficiently. Moreover, it entitles the seller to be just as self-interested in making that choice within the contract as she was without the contract when she was deciding whether or not to enter it. That's a structural feature of contract law. Parties to contracts are allowed to be selfish in their contracts. The only constraint is they must do what the contract promised, but they don't have to go any further or be generous or altruistic to their counterpart. Incidentally, and as an aside, there's a second remedy that is exactly as efficient as this one. All right. Uh, which just has a mirror image structure. It's not specific performance in the conventional sense. Because specific performance in the conventional sense, you see, leaves it up to the buyer whether the seller will trade or not, but does not give the buyer efficient incentives. Because the buyer does not bear the full costs of commanding the seller to trade. The efficient performance remedy is the following. Leave it up to the buyer to choose whether or not the seller will deliver the good, but give the buyer an additional right. The buyer can force the seller to breach and disgorge the gains from breaching. All right, so under the expectation regime, the seller chooses between trading and transferring, and the transfer is the buyer's valuation. And under the efficient performance regime, the buyer chooses between trading and transferring, but the transfer term is now the seller's gain from breach. That's a regime, it's the perfect mirror image of the expectation remedy. In that regime, the buyer chooses unilaterally, but chooses between alternatives that cause the buyer to bear the full social costs of her choice. Notice again, under the efficient performance regime, the buyer acts purely self-interestedly within the contract. Has no altruism. Now, I don't believe the efficient performance regime, by the way, no legal system in history has had the efficient performance remedy. I think there are transactions cost reasons. Uh, how much time have I got? I'm okay? 20 minutes, okay, good. So I'm gonna per permit myself a brief aside. How many of you here have heard of the Kosian theory of the firm? Yes. 
the students. Do you know the Coase theory of the firm? Of the firm. Of the firm, not the Coase theorem, but the Coase mm -hmm. theory of the firm. So this is one of the great ideas in the history of 20th century economic thought. And it's also aesthetically great because Coase asked himself a question which one thinks could not possibly have an answer. And then he proceeded to answer it. The question was this, why in the world are there many firms rather than no firms at all or just one big firm? So you can imagine there's just one company that does everything in the world. Or you can imagine there are no companies, they're just individuals. But in fact, what we see is a world where there are many firms somewhere in between. And asked in that way, the question is like, how could that possibly be, have an answer? How can you even frame a question so abstract and vague? Um, but Coase answers it, and it's a little bit like, uh, here's another question that's like that, but much less weighty. Who is the most highly respected or most historically important figure ever to turn down a full professorship at Harvard University. You would think there couldn't possibly be one person who clearly is that, but there is. You know who it is? Galileo. <laughs> when, when Galileo was excommunicated, Harvard College was four years old. And the head of Harvard College wrote him a letter saying, would you like to become our new professor of metaphysical astronomy? <laughs> and Galileo answered, I prefer house arrest. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right? But here's how Coase answered the question. He asked himself this. There are two different ways of coordinating economic activity. One is through administration, hierarchical command and control. The other is through contract. That is, say, by agreeing and then enforcing an agreement. As firms get bigger, the costs of hierarchical command and control go up. As contracts get more elaborate, the costs of contracting go up. A firm will grow, Coase said, just until the incremental cost of growing further through command and control exceeds the cost of coordinating with others through contract, at which point it will stop growing. Very concretely, this happens all the time. There are cookies and coffee out there. The Universidad de Chile is a firm, and it had to decide. It doesn't want to have its own bakery. <laughs> and produce cookies and coffee by command and control? Or does it want to acquire cookies and coffee by contract with a different firm? It has a make or buy decision, and in this instance, it decided to buy, which is entirely rational. Why? Because transactions cost are lower. All right. That argument explains why you never see the efficient performance remedy. Why? How do you describe a buyer who has the legal authority to command her seller to breach a contract and discord the gain from breach. That buyer owns the seller. <laughs> that buyer owns the seller. So you don't see it as part of contract law, but it is exactly the way firms organize themselves inside. So the expectation remedy, as it were, is constitutive of contract. The efficient performance remedy is constitutive of administration within the firm. End of aside, but for the students, Go read the Coase theory of the firm. It is a great article, a great article. Now, back to the main argument. Notice a feature of these regimes. They leave the parties, as I've said, free to be as self-interested within the contract as they were without the contract. That is the marker that distinguishes contractual relations from fiduciary relations. Fiduciary relations are constituted by the idea that the fiduciary may not be as self-interested within the fiduciary relationship as she was without it. If I'm your fiduciary, if I'm your lawyer, for example, or your partner, or for that matter, your spouse, I have an obligation, not just to respect the terms of our agreement up front, but to be willing to shoulder additional burdens that I had not anticipated in order to serve your interests as they arise. That's very clear in the traditional marriage vow, which in English says, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. <laughs> the same as <laughs> Which means precisely what we intend to do when we enter into this relationship is have the scope of the relationship exceed what we can imagine about it today. <laughs>
That's the purpose of a marriage. That's the purpose of a partnership. I think that's the purpose of a legal representation. These are all relationships whose value, not just to the individual parties, but to the broader society, comes from the fact that the parties opened themselves up to evolving together in a certain way, and in a way that they cannot imagine up front. But a contract isn't like that. The purpose of a contract is to allow the parties to coordinate based exclusively on their current intentions. And so that's a structural difference between contract relations and fiduciary relations. And the fiduciary remedy of disgorgement is the earnest of the obligation of the fiduciary to evolve her sense of what it is that she has to do depending on the interest of the beneficiary. Now, this structure, and here's where I'll end, makes contract law and fiduciary law very, very different in their moral and doctrinal character. So on the one hand, contract law, the remedy is the expectation. Fiduciary law, the remedy is restitution. Sorry, am I, this is a, the keyboard is slightly different, right? Contract law, the core duty is good faith. What good faith means, in fact, is honoring the terms of the contract. Good faith in performance. I'll talk a little bit about good faith in negotiations, which is a civil law duty that the common law rejects. The core duty in fiduciary law is loyalty and care. Well, loyalty. Now, we just got rid of care. A little bit of law reform. <laughs> you know, uh, do you know Wallace Stevens? Yeah. Great American modernist poet who, uh, what did I just do? There we are. Uh, Wallace Stevens, his greatest poem is Notes Toward a Supreme Fiction. And um, when he sent it off to the printer, he sent it with instructions that it was extremely important to him that each line of poetry appear in only one line of text on the printed page, and that if the printer couldn't fit a line in, he could just cut words as needed in order to make it fit. And PhD dissertations have been written about why this word rather than that word is in the poem. And at least in some cases, the reason is that the printer could fit this word rather than that word on the page. So that's, that's, how, you, that's how you make great art, and that's how you make great law. Fit it on the page. Um, good faith and loyalty. Here's another big difference between contract law and fiduciary law, all right? Contract law is anti-paternalist. In other words, freedom of contract is a core value. What that means is that the law won't look through the party's intentions in order to do what it thinks is good for them. Instead, the law will simply enforce what the parties have chosen. Fiduciary law, by contrast, is deeply paternalist. So in the fiduciary law, say, of lawyer and client, there are many things the law won't let the parties do. If I'm your fiduciary in some other ways, if I'm, for example, your guardian and you're my ward, I have to make decisions for you based on my view of what's in your interest, not your intentions. That's true for partners. It's also actually true for spouses. You know, one of the things that my wife and I get by being married is we get to say to each other, I know you better than you know yourself, and you think this is what you want, but actually, <laughs> right? She gets to say it to me, and I get the benefit of her saying it, and I get to say it to her, and she gets the somewhat more dubious benefit of my saying it. But that's what we want from the relation. We want to create a relation in which we have the right to paternalize each other, because that's what a certain kind of intimacy comes out of. And then the last structural distinction is that in contract, the form of recognition is abstract. When I make a contract with you, I recognize you as being a creature that has the capacity to contract, that has a point of view, that has intentions, that can have authority over me to whom I can owe an obligation. That's why I can't make a contract with a chair. It's also, incidentally, why in, for example, the United States during the slavery period, you couldn't make a contract with a slave. It's why before the Married Women's Property Acts, 
contracts with married women were impossible. It's why today, contracts with children, with minor children, are not enforceable generally. Notice, slaves, married women, and minor children could be liable in tort and in criminal law. So contractual recognition was the recognition of a higher legal status. It was the status to choose one's obligations and to assert them in a certain way. But it's abstract because all you're recognizing is the general capacity to form intentions and function in this way. Whereas fiduciary recognition is concrete. You recognize the person for the person whom they are. My wife recognizes me not as a generic legal subject, <laughs> but as me. And I recognize her as her. And that's essential to the relationship. A lawyer, as you'll all see if you become lawyers, or for those of us who already are lawyers, one of the things you have to learn how to do is to understand what it is your client wants that your client doesn't know she wants. And then you have to, if you're a good lawyer, explain it to her in terms that she comes to see that this is in fact what she wants. But you don't do that with your contracting partner. Your contracting partner, you know, they form their intentions, you, you might try to persuade them, but it's not your job. Whereas it's essential to the lawyer's role to figure out what this particular client wants, or what this particular spouse wants, or what this particular ward wants. And so, the style of the relationship is completely different. Now, all of this might seem largely obvious to civil lawyers. The reason why I've gone through it all is that in the common law recently, there has been a move to suggest that fiduciary relations don't exist, that all fiduciary relations are, are certain kinds of contracts. Contracts in which there are informational asymmetries that the parties would like the court to fix ex post. And that seems to me to be a grave mistake. It's a mistake, first and foremost, of the understanding. It doesn't recognize that there are two kinds of ways in which private parties can engage each other. One is characterized by the features on the left-hand side of the chart and the other is characterized by the features of the right-hand side of the chart. And these are fundamentally different. Now, we can always ask which spheres of life should be regulated by contract and which spheres of life should be regulated by fiduciary relations. And simply understanding the structural difference won't in itself solve that question for us. Values come into play. But if we don't understand it, we'll get into deep, deep confusion. And the last thing I'll say is that an example of the threat of that confusion, and actually a case where courts didn't fall into it, is same-sex marriage. You see, most political philosophers of a basically liberal bent, who thought that it was unwarranted, unjust, and discriminatory for the state to recognize <coughs> opposite-sex marriages but not same-sex marriages, thought that they were required by that observation to conclude that the state shouldn't recognize marriage at all as a distinctive legal type. Marriage is just a contract. Free and equal people should be allowed to arrange their affairs however they want. And the state should get out of this business. Notice that's not what happened even in states that have come to recognize same-sex marriage. They haven't said it's a contract. They've said it's a status relation and the state is involved. All we're doing is we're liberalizing the status relation. We're not contractualizing it. That would have been an ununderstandable thought to many critics of old-fashioned marriage, because they wouldn't have seen that there's a structural difference between contract and fiduciary relations. Sometimes you should contractualize, but sometimes you should liberalize without contractualizing. And that's the take-home from this otherwise abstract argument. Thank you very much. Agradecemos al profesor Markovich por su presentación y a continuación invitamos al profesor Enrique Barros a realizar sus comentarios y presentación también. Bueno, los míos son comentarios y quiero ante todo felicitar a ustedes por la invitación del profesor Markovich que en verdad es un, es un jurista y un intelectual de primera nota ¿eh? realmente y, y también desde mi punto de vista es una generación más abajo entonces también es, un, es, es muy atractivo conocer 
Okay, to know what uh, the next generation are thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I, I will speak in Spanish. May, may, may I say, I'm yeah. extremely flattered that I'm still thought of as the next generation. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my purpose. <laughs> no, no, I'm really flattered. I'm really flattered. Yeah. And, and I am afraid I, I have to speak in Spanish after the, uh, after the soccer play we have played today. <laughs> so that, uh, to translate Spanish spontaneously my, my, my notes, it would be almost impossible. In eh, verdad, I, I will I, I will try to to concentrate in the, ma in the most in the main points so that we can understand. Yes. Eh, yo siempre he pensado que las diferencias entre el common law y el derecho civil son más técnicas que funcionales. Al final, por caminos muy distintos, se llega a resultados que no son muy diferentes. Eh, claro, los caminos son muy distintos. En la primera frase de, del texto que hemos leído dice: The restatement second of the contracts observes, among other banalities of contract law, that expectation damages constitute the preferred remedy of breach of contract. Bueno, nosotros el año pasado, aquí, the last year, in Valparaíso, we have had the visit of a French professor, Professor Denis Massot a, a well-known uh, civil law professor who said that el, la ejecución en naturaleza pertenecía al corazón moral del derecho de contrato. O sea, es exactamente el otro punto, digamos, ¿no es cierto? Pero si uno analiza el, eh, cómo funcionan un sistema y el otro, yo siempre he pensado que eh, los resultados no son tan distintos. A ver, vamos a ver, por ejemplo, qué pasa con, con Specific Performers en un derecho como el chileno. Eh, yo diría que el mayor avance o el mayor cambio que ha habido en el derecho de contratos en el último tiempo es que spe Specific Performers es, no es un remedio preferido. Es uno entre varios. Uh -huh. A la elección, to the choice, uh -huh. of the credit. Uh -huh. Y en ese sentido, lo que ocurre con el remedio de específico performance es que mejora la posición del acreedor en el sentido de que él ve si usa termination, resolution, eh, damages, specific performance. Y a su vez la specific performance tampoco hay que tenerlo muy en claro, muy, 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 muy este, literal. Porque la specific performance en la tradición del derecho civil, por lo menos eso lo vemos claramente en Chile, en Alemania es exactamente igual, rara vez se traduce propiamente en específicas <coughs> performance. Uh, uh, you know, usually it's not, a uh, the remedy is uh, not a, 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 a exactly a specific right. performance. You have a remedy which is for the value of the, of, of the performance. Right. Right. En, el, en, el derecho civil, en el derecho procesal civil chileno, solo muy excepcionalmente, excepcionally, hay una una acción que tenga por objeto que se cumpla literalmente en una obligación de hacer well, a service, uh -huh. por ejemplo. Uh -huh. It is not possible to, to, right. to, uh, to, uh, right. to execute uh, the, uh, the, 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 the execution right. by right. the debtor. But you have, a, you, have an, uh, you have an action for asking for the value of the, uh -huh. of the, of, of, of the, of the service. So that en definitiva, la específica performance en el derecho chileno está reducida a los casos en que el interés, específico performance in their own terms, mm -hmm. eh, eh, está reducida a los casos en que el interés del acreedor solo se puede satisfacer con el bien o la prestación tal como fue convenida. Por ejemplo, si yo tengo una casa y compro una casa vecina, a neighbor house, For 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 for, for forming a you know a, a, a big a bigger space for for building or, or for another purpose, I need this house. You know, it is not it is it, it is not no. useful for, for for me to receive money. But when you go to the common law, the solution is not so different. Right. In some cases, the specific performance is not a general remedy, but you have. Usually, you have that remedy 
in well, your the satisfaction of your interest has, uh, depends mm -hmm. of the specific, specific right. performance. O sea, en ese sentido yo pienso que el, 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 el derecho de... El, el, digamos, ahí hay una gran discusión, yo creo que esto ha sido lo han metido en lo, el lawyer economics, pero yo tengo la impresión de que toda esta discusión es más un refinamiento teórico que, que, un, que, que un efecto práctico. Esa es la primera observación que yo quisiera hacer. ¿eh? Eh, en segundo lugar, eh, bueno, eh, Estados Unidos es curioso porque Estados Unidos tiene un origen, tiene un origen en el common law. Pero yo diría que de todos los sistemas jurídicos es probablemente el más continental de los sistemas jurídicos actuales. En otras palabras, hasta la Cámara de los Lores, la Corte Suprema en, Estados, en Inglaterra, cita frecuentemente jurisprudencia alemana, incluso francesa, eh, o la jurisprudencia americana o australiana. Estados Unidos es un país que de alguna manera es continental, es un, es un continente en sí mismo y por consiguiente de alguna manera, digamos, las influencias que tiene del derecho comparado son mucho menos intensas que las influencias que tenemos países como nosotros, que tenemos además una cultura jurídica débil. The legal culture, uh, weak legal culture. So we have to, to look everywhere. <laughs> And, y eso de alguna manera, digamos, nos hace, nos hace una vocación comparativista muchísimo mayor. ¿eh? Y yo pienso que esa vocación comparativista, comparativista de alguna manera nos lleva a constatar que las diferencias que hay entre los sistemas, entre los sistemas de diversas soluciones jurídicas, más bien es por el camino que siguen que por el resultado que arriban. Ahora, el trabajo de, de Daniel, Mar, Daniel Mar, eh, Markowitz es completamente fascinante, en mi opinión. Eh, las obligaciones fiduciarias son poco tratadas en el derecho civil. Poco. Eh, they are not, um, they are not analyzed. Yes. In the, in, in the general class. Uh, uh, yes, that is. In, in the civil law tradition. En Chile mismo, el mejor el trabajo que hay es de un joven ayudante en esa época, Diego Pardo, que ahora está en Estados Unidos, que es una especie de obligaciones fiduciarias en, en, los, en las funciones de administración. Y Dana asume que eh, el remedio de las, de, los, de, los, de las obligaciones fiduciarias es una, una premisa que me ha interesado muchísimo en su artículo, sería el discouragement, vale es decir, el, la, la restitución de los beneficios que ha obtenido, digamos, quien ha violado la, 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 la obligación fiduciaria. De nuevo, yo creo que ahí estamos en un problema que es bien difícil, fíjate que yo quiero hacer esta reflexión aprovechando la, la, eh, el excelente paper. Eh, es extremadamente difícil, digamos, comparar sistemas jurídicos cuando los conceptos se superponen sin tener el mismo significado. Por ejemplo, Good Faith. Good faith is used in, Americans, in, in the American legal language and it used in the yeah. civil law tradition, in, even in the English law tradition, mm -hmm. now. Pero, ¿qué significa good faith in the tradition American? Ahí lo vemos. El contrato aparece, la good faith aparece como eh, en una línea con eh, una. Eh, con, ¿Qué es el concepto? Expectation. Expectation, yeah. Expectation. Yeah, bueno, eso no tiene nada que ver en este caso. Yeah. Pero good faith en, en oposición a loyalty. Eh, good faith en oposición a paternalismo. Good faith en oposición a concrete. Y ocurre que si uno mira lo que ha ocurrido en, el derecho, en la tradición del derecho civil, en verdad el concepto de buena fe ha cumplido las tres funciones, no de la derecha, de la izquierda, sino la de la derecha. ¿Estamos? Ha cumplido la función básicamente de loyalty, que es un concepto que básicamente está orientado a crear obligaciones de lealtad. Ustedes probablemente no lo conocen, pero no lo, no lo, usted tiene un trabajo muy bonito sobre, sobre deberes de coordinación y de cooperación, y deberes contractuales de cooperación. Y, bueno, esos deberes de cooperación son normalmente tipificados, concebidos, definidos como deberes de buena fe. Oh, from good faith. Se fija entonces, resulta que de alguna manera existe que las palabras son las mismas, o sea, traducidas literalmente, pero sin embargo los conceptos funcionalmente son por completo diferentes. 
la buena fe en general, en el derecho del civil, cumple dos funciones. Cumple una función que es, que podríamos llamar lo que ustedes llaman en general en el derecho, en, 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 en habla inglesa, de implicit terms. Implicit terms son básicamente aquellos que no están expresados, vale decir exactamente en la otra línea, en, más en la línea de la derecha que en la de la izquierda. ¿No es cierto? Son implicit terms because, porque las partes no han discutido en extenso todas las consecuencias que se pueden seguir y pueden salir sorpresas. Pueden surgir elementos que no han sido previstos. Pueden haber conductas que de alguna manera merecen ser analizadas. De alguna manera eso hace que la good faith, el eh, la buena fe tenga una función expansiva no llamemos en moralización del contrato, que también la tiene, sino de, llamémoslo así, más allá de los términos, el contrato como institución, como práctica. ¿No es cierto? Yo diría que uno de, los, uno, de los, uno de los efectos que más fuerte tiene la buena fe, la good fe, en the civil law tradition, es to transform the Kantian promise in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in, 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 in a sort of participation of a practice of promise. And the participation in a practice of promise significa que no solo yo estoy obligado a lo que prometí, sino lo que la práctica de la promesa supone. O sea, en ese sentido, digamos, va mucho más allá de lo que es el... Y lo segundo que tiene la buena fe, y esto, yo en los últimos meses he estado dedicado un poco a las, a las, a las fuentes del derecho civil más antiguas del siglo XVII y XVI, un poco histórico, eh, la buena fe también tiene un elemento que es fundamental en el derecho civil que es, de alguna manera favorecer la cooperación y evitar el abuso y evitar el abuso de abuso y al evitar el abuso es muy interesante porque al evitar el abuso de alguna manera si uno lo mira en el derecho moderno y eso me ha resultado muy atractivo de tu presentación es básicamente que para eliminar el abuso, de alguna manera, el concepto de buena fe asume que las partes están en un determinado estatus. En otras palabras, el consumidor está en un estatus de consumidor. El, 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 el ego frente al experto está en un estatus de ego. Y por lo tanto hay deberes que tiene una parte respecto de la otra que se deben precisamente a ese estatus. Y de alguna manera, por consiguiente, eh, yo diría que el, 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 la buena fe establece deberes de colaboración que están dentro del contrato. Ahora, ¿dónde está el cambio que yo veo y dónde está el punto efectivo, dónde está el punto central de la idea de, de obligaciones fiduciarias? El punto central de la, de la noción de, de obligaciones fiduciarias creo que tiene que ver no con los deberes que surgen de lealtad y de confianza en razón de la buena fe, sino con algo que va más allá. It go, goes beyond yes. the, the loyalty and yes. the, uh, of okay. the, of the, uh, the exigida por la buena fe. Goes beyond and ask for some altruism. Yes. Las, 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 las eh, obligaciones fiduciarias en el fondo se caracterizan porque es un altruismo no voluntario, es un altruismo debido. ¿no es cierto? Pero se exige en las relaciones fiduciarias que la persona que tiene una obligación fiduciaria posponga su propio interés en favor del interés de la persona en cuyo, en cuyo nombre o interés está actuando. Eh, yo cuando fui a... I, I was the chairman of the, of the, of the, of the Bar Association oh, no. en Chile. Yeah. And you know, we prepare a new, a new, a new code of, of good practices. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, y una de las principales normas de este código dice así, es el tercera. Dice, el abogado debe actuar siempre en mejor interés del cliente. In the best right, right, oh, right. y anteponer dicho interés al de cualquier otra persona incluyendo el suyo propio en el cumplimiento de este deber el abogado debe respetar la autonomía y dignidad del cliente el deber de lealtad del abogado no tiene otro, otro, otro límite que el respeto a la ley y las reglas de este código en otras palabras hay ciertas relaciones que efectivamente suponen postergar el propio interés en favor del interés del otro, de alguna manera suponen, exigen un altruismo, una actitud altruista. Y en ese sentido, este, me recordó algo que leí hace algunos años y que lo, lo vi ahora, un, yo no sé si tú conoces a Joshua Getzler, un, 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 
es un, un lecturer en, en Oxford, ¿no es cierto? Que tiene un muy bonito, en un, un muy buen artículo en un, en un libro de homenaje a, a Peter Burks. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Sí. Eh, y él dice que hay tres tipos de altruismo, tres niveles de altruismo. Tres niveles de altruismo. Me estoy tratando de introducir en las obligaciones fiduciarias. Tres niveles de altruismo. El más elemental es no causar daño. No to, to cause damages to, uh -huh. to another person. Es uh -huh. negativo. Uh -huh. El segundo es positivo. Y dice, es el deber de actuar con diligencia y con destreza, como traducirían ustedes, destreza... Bueno, pero y las obligaciones de diligencia y destreza de alguna manera asumen una asum, asumen una especial responsabilidad. El médico tiene una especial responsabilidad. El abogado tiene una especial responsabilidad. El, eh, no sé, el educador. Sí, claro. ¿No es cierto? El profesor o el, o, el, o, el, o el maestro de escuela tiene una especial relación y una obligación responsabilidad personal. Y de eso, de alguna manera, yo me, me creo que voy a poder aprender, voy a tratar de ver cómo se puede introducir esa idea de que la relación contractual, es el, tú la planteas como estratégica. Y la relación fiduciaria claro. como antiestratégica. Claro. ¿No es cierto? Y esa, esa enumeración de alguna manera responde a esos dos conceptos. Yo creo que hay ciertas relaciones que son estratégicas. Por ejemplo, cuando dos firmas negocian. Cuando dos firmas negocian el contraction right. contract. Right. ¿No es cierto? Right. Oh, bueno, ellos se cuidan a sí mismos. Pero hay ciertos mm. grados en que uno tiene que ir cuidando el interés del otro. Mm -hmm. Y que van desde la buena fe, los deberes de la de la buena fe hasta las relaciones propiamente fiduciarias, en que el modelo del matrimonio me parece claro, extremo, ¿no? De <risa> modo of, of marriage, ¿ya? Yeah. Es, es, es extremo porque resulta que en el fondo es la más fiduciaria de las relaciones, digamos, en que los deberes se justifican por sí mismos y no por una decisión estratégica que va detrás de eso. O sea, eh, yo estoy de acuerdo con eso. Ahora creo por lo demás que hay un problema que no debemos no debemos olvidar ¿eh? que los tipos de relaciones fiduciarias son muy distintos ¿no? tú mismo lo dices no eh, bueno marriage es un extremo sí, claro. <ríe> no siento marriage es un extremo este eh, corporation uh -huh. yeah, for some uh -huh. fiduciary duties uh -huh. bueno agency uh -huh. el mandato no es cierto pero hay una serie de otras este, este, eh, situaciones en que producen fio, situaciones fiduciarias. Bueno, el caso más típico es el trust americano. Trust. El trust, que nosotros no tenemos. Sí, claro. Claro, tú, tú lo sabes. Nosotros no tenemos la figura del trust. Y todas las obligaciones fiduciarias, tú mismo lo dices, yeah. se derivan, digamos, originalmente de, 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 la idea, de la idea del trust. Nosotros no lo tenemos. ¿Qué más fiduciario que alguien que yo te entregue a ti la propiedad para que se la pase a Daniel? y tú lo tengas que cuidar, mantener y, todo, y pasarle los frutos. Esa es una situación de absoluta confianza, que tú tienes que tener una relación que no está dada estratégicamente por una posición, sino por un deber que es posponer todos tus intereses al, 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 al cumplimiento del deber fiduciario. Yo creo que eso es algo que me ha, que me ha conmovido harto y yo creo que es bien importante. Por lo demás tengo entendido que el primer caso de obligaciones fiduciarias eh, en Inglaterra, por aquí lo tengo anotado, el, eh, tuvo su origen precisamente en el Bramford Bucket Case, ¿eh? en el siglo XVIII, uh -huh. en que resulta que había un, había un trust construido a favor de un niño, el beneficiario era un niño que era incapaz, y el trust significaba básicamente que se le entregaba al trustee la administración de un, del Bramford Market, de un mercado, que él arrendaba, y él así tenía que recoger las rentas, guardarlas para el pupilo, para, cuando, para el niño cuando fuera mayor. Y resulta que se terminó el arriendo, por razones técnicas, no por razones de... Se termina el arriendo que, estaba, que venía de antes y resulta que el trustee contrata para, con, dice, este, eh, decide contratar el arriendo para sí mismo. Y hay un, el fallo que es bien notable del, de, de, del juez, de Lord King, dice, 
lo voy a leer en, en castellano porque lo traduje. Parece difícil que el traspi sea la única persona en toda la humanidad que no pueda arrendar la propiedad. Es es difícil de imaginar que el traspi es the only man, the only one in the in, in the whole mankind, mankind who cannot who cannot who cannot rent the property. Pero esta es una regla muy correcta y no debe ser relajada porque sus consecuencias serían indeseables porque los trastis tienen que cuidarse por sí mismos entonces de alguna manera la obligación que tiene el trastí de acuerdo con esta regla ah, e hicieron ahí la sanción fue discorso la sanción fue precisamente que las rentas de arrendamiento que el trastí había recibido they have to be restricted o sea, de alguna manera este, es, una, es, una, es, una, es algo que, que para nosotros es sumamente importante y creo que hay muchas relaciones que son en diversos grados fiduciarias y descubrir de qué manera digamos, puede generar este tipo de obligaciones, obligaciones este, digamos, eh, particularmente intensas es muy importante. Ahora, yo tengo una duda. Eh, en general, en el derecho civil y en el common law, no se admite que haya, haya acción de enriquecimiento, o sea, de acción de, de, de disgorsement, uh -huh. o restitution, de, of profits, cuando hay un contrato. ¿No es cierto? El incumplimiento del contrato no da lo yo creo en eso estamos totalmente de acuerdo, y la solución que, la solución que tú planteas es que apropiarse de lo que no es una, una non-market eh, uh -huh. eh, non pro profit, no, no, no trade, ¿cómo lo llamas? No trade, eh, no trade no, no trading game. No trading game. Non trading game. El no trading game, eso naturalmente que es una cosa que, por otro camino que es menos intelectual, digamos, en el derecho civil, en el de cómo lo se llega a esa conclusión, que en un contrato uno no tiene derecho a, a exigir que devuelvan los, los, las ventajas que haya obtenido el, el deudor de su incumplimiento. Ahora, eso mismo a mí me lleva a pensar que la calificación como... De, los, de relaciones fiduciarias como no contractuales, ¿no es cierto?, puede ser útil eh, desde ese punto de vista, pero tiene también ciertos riesgos, porque hay ciertas relaciones que son aparentemente muy contractuales, relaciones fiduciary relations, which are really contractual, uh -huh. agency, uh -huh. eh, la relación que... Uh, eh, pues, eh, Even, even, the, 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 even the relationship between lawyer and, and, and client and between patient and, 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 and medical, you know, eh, so that, en definitiva, creo que puede ser un poco excesivo extinguir, extender ese principio fiduciario a relaciones que tienen una base también contractual. Y tanto es así que lo que no se puede hacer, que lo que no se puede hacer, por ejemplo, en mi opinión, es que en el caso de un incumplimiento por el médico o el incumplimiento por el abogado cuando el lawyer doesn't, doesn't uh, make his, his task yeah. hay inf infracción de contrato uh -huh. y también hay daños puede, dem puede, puede demandar daños puede he has an action for damages, for damages. When the, the, the agent hasn't act mm -hmm. uh, with due care, right? Yeah. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the beneficiary or the, the, the person who has been represented by the agent has an action, usually has an action for the damages caused by the agent, not just a disgorgement of the, of the, of the, of, of the, of the agent. So that, esa es mi pregunta principal, digamos. Yo no sé, hay una doctrina fuerte que, de que del contrato no surgen acciones restitutorias de ganancia. Yo creo que hay buena razón y yo creo que la primera parte de tu exposición fue clarísima en ese sentido, ¿no es cierto? De que non-trade games, no trading games, no, tenían, no tienen ningún derecho el acreedor a apropiárselo. Él sí tiene derecho a cobrar sus daños. Y eso mismo puede ocurrir en relaciones que tienen una fase, una phase, a fiduciary phase, uh -huh. and another contract phase. <laughs> you know? Ese es el, el mayor problema que me, que me sigue. Uh -huh. Y por último, uh, at the end, I, 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 I like to, 
many notes. Huh? <laughs> but, uh, uh, for finishing, I, I, I'd like to, to express and, you know, you have said that fiduciary duties are not predetermined by the contract. Mm -hmm. They evolve during the contract or your, during the fiduciary relationship. Yeah, that is true. That is true, and I think it is, it's a very good point that, that that is. But my question is, my point is that not yet fiduciary uh, uh, relationships have this character. There are some obligation, contractual obligation, in which the, uh, the, uh, how, the, how the obligator has to act, how to handle, is not predefined by the contract. Those obligations are, are, are named in the civil law tradition obligation of means. Mm -hmm. That is, you have to put all, th those are obligations of best effort mm -hmm. in, yes. in, 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 in the American tradition, in some sense. In some sense. In some sense. We should talk about that. Yes, in some sense. Uh, and, and, and many of these obligations are sure are not fiduciary right. obligations. Y abrimos la oportunidad de que el público pueda formular eh, a su vez preguntas o comentarios. Pero primeramente, el profesor Daniel Marco, si desea comentar algo. Sí. Yeah. So let me try to say something. That I thought this was incredibly helpful, and I'm very, very grateful. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was extremely perceptive. Let me say something starting with the more concrete and then moving back to, a, to more abstract. Some of the things that you were saying at the end uh, seem to me obviously right as descriptions of the law and also obviously right as statements of legal theory. And I'd like to try to explain them in a slightly different way that I think is more aligned to the way I look at this and see whether you think I've got, I've still captured what you're saying or whether you think in fact the transformation shows that I don't understand something. Um, so, um, first of all, I think one thing we clearly agree about is that there are all sorts of relationships that in the common law, let's say, have traditionally been called fiduciary that really ought to be contractual. And maybe some of these relationships also ought to be massively liberalized even if they should stay fiduciary. So in the trustee case, should the, should the trustee be able to contract with the trust or not. It seems probably if the trustee contracts with the trust in a way that's for the best interest of the beneficiary, that's obviously better for the beneficiary and the trustee ought to be allowed to do it. And there's no problem there. And it may even be that certain kinds of trusts really should just be contracts. Maybe, for example, take another case, the duties of corporate managers to shareholders. Maybe they should just be contractual, especially if the shareholders are sophisticated. And if the shareholders want to contract away some obligation, why not let them do it? You know, these are sophisticated people. Let, just let it be contract. Um, I think there's no, no problem there. Uh, in addition, there are lots and lots of relationships that fall somewhere in between the two very stark ideal types Absolutely. that I've described. Um, and they'll have a little bit of one, a little bit of the other, and that doesn't mean that they're misshapen. It just means that life participates in lots of different values all at the same time. And that's even true of the extreme case of marriage, which is also just basically a contract to pool assets and reduce collective expenses. And that's an important, it's an important part of marriage. You know, uh, this book I'm doing on, on distributive justice right now that I talked about earlier, um, the fact that educated couples stay married and less educated couples in the United States no longer stay married. Well, two people who are both in the 50th percentile by income, if they're married, the household moves into the 80th percentile. But if they're not married and one of them has the children, that household is in the 20th percentile. So purely economically, it's the difference between being pretty rich and being in poverty. And that's what marriage does, and that's obviously part of it. The law has to, so I think we agree about that. Um, so that, that's one thing that, that I wanted to say. Um, here it's the same. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, another thing I wanted to say along these lines, which is a point where we might disagree a little bit more, is in some of these relationships, we might disagree about whether to think of them mostly as contractual or mostly as fiduciary. So let's take a contract that has a best efforts clause in it. Um, there may be some contracts that have a best efforts clause where we both agree they're just contractual. And what makes them distinctively contractual is the best efforts. If a court has to determine what that means, ex post, in a contractual case, it will ask, what do we think the parties intended it to mean? And the inquiry into interpreting best efforts always has to run back through the intentions of the parties. There may be other contracts that have a best efforts term. And a good example in common law is franchise relationships. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> where the court does not feel itself constrained only to ask what would the parties have intended, but also feels entitled to ask what would be fair. <laughs> and on my view, insofar as the court does that, it's treating the relationship as a fiduciary relationship, not as a contractual relationship. And I think it's always an open question when the court should do that and when it shouldn't. And I don't view what I've been saying to answer that question, just to identify the question. Now, maybe a more general case of this actually it goes the other way. I had a conversation about, about this set of ideas with some German lawyers recently. And one of the things that came out is that maybe one way to think of, say, German consumer law, especially older German consumer law, mm -hmm. before it became okay. infected by the US model, let's say. <laughs> um, when good faith in negotiations, for example, was a very powerful principle and application of German consumer law, understood consumer as a status relation. As a, so the consumer law of Germany was a fiduciary law, in fact. That's what I understand. Yes, and it was, <laughs> it was structured not to promote the interests of the consumers as the consumers thought of them, but rather to induce people to consume in ways the society thought was appropriate. Mm -hmm. All right? And, and that may actually be a better consumer law. <laughs> you know, it's certainly the case if you, I'm living in Berlin this year. Um, and uh, one interesting thing about walking through Berlin, as opposed to walking through an American city, is that in Berlin, nobody is dangerously overweight. And nobody is dangerously in debt. And there's a reason. And the reason is that the law is systematically structured to make it very hard to borrow and to prevent people from regularly eating as much as they want. <laughs> the portions are different. The consumer law is different. You can't, buy, you, know, you can't buy things with credit cards in most German stores. It's not possible. All right? So that's a, that's a fiduciary relation idea, in fact. All right, so that, that, was, that was one other thing I wanted. Now, um, two other points, then I'll stop. One is a point in which I think that the civilians are exactly right, and common lawyers, especially those inspired by law and economics, are exactly wrong. And I think this came out of some of the things that you said. For common lawyers, there's no difference between, or at least for law and economics types, between a, a real legal rule and a gap filler. Mm. All right? mm. A legal rule just is a gap filler in this world. Yeah. But that's obviously crazy. It's crazy theoretically, because there's all the difference in the world between something that the law provides in order for the arrangement between the parties to be normatively coherent, and something that the law provides to complete the arrangement between the parties. And the remedies are a good example of this. So the expectation remedy, for example, might be thought of by law and economics people as just a gap filler. The parties haven't specified a remedy, and so the law steps in and fills a gap. But that just raises the question, well, what does it mean for the parties to have an obligation in the first place, and a legally enforceable obligation? And to answer that question, 
the law actually has to provide, not a gap filler, but a framework for making the party's relationship a legal one. Absolutely. And part of that framework will be a remedy. Absolutely. Right? And that's why I say, on my view, there's only one remedy for breach of contract in specific performance. It's not a gap filler. It's a real legal rule. Now, what specific performance involved might be a gap filler. Right? And that's a distinction I think is very important that I think you were rightly insisting on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what I want to say for now before others join in. ¿Alguna pregunta del público? Hola, eh, mi nombre es Sebastián Fuentes. Eh, lamentablemente no puedo formular la pregunta en inglés. ¿ya? Así que, sí, gracias. <risa> no sé si la podrán explicar o algo, pero... Eh, Google Cabo, Cabo, Translate. <risa> sí. Eh, pero hab, hablo despacio, por favor. Eh, es que resulta que, ya, uno está por un lado contra el suelo y otro lado anti -diciario. Pero por mucho que ustedes como compartieran que algunos tipos de relaciones creen son contractuales y otros tipos de relaciones son fiduciarias, ¿cuáles son los criterios para determinar o cuáles son los criterios en los cuales ustedes como que están de acuerdo para determinar cuándo se aplica una lógica y cuándo se aplica la otra? Porque, por ejemplo, se lo habían mencionado que el derecho del consumidor en Alemania era como más fiduciario, mientras que acá es totalmente contractual. Es que por eso, ¿cuáles son como los criterios que ustedes podrían como determinar para decir cuándo es la relación es contractual y cuándo es la relación es well, are you asking a descriptive question or a normative question? Descriptive. descriptive. So it may not be easy to answer the descriptive question without going into the norms. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So, so one way to determine when a relationship is fiduciary is to ask the question, what's the best understanding of the entire normative framework associated with the legal system? And would it make that relationship appear to be fiduciary or appear to be contractual? Let me take an example raised by some of your remarks, the lawyer-client relationship. Mm -hmm. Lawyer-client relationship is one that is entered into by the parties through a contract. Now, what one might think is, okay, that makes it a contractual relationship. And one might even think, if it has certain elements that appear to be fiduciary, that's just because the parties have chosen those elements. My view is that that's not right, that the lawyer-client relationship, even though it's entered into by a contract, is a fiduciary relation. Partly that you can see, and this is the, the less normative part of your answer, there are all sorts of mandatory terms in that relationship that the parties cannot vary, even by agreement. So in the United States, for example, the parties can't contract for the lawyer to decide whether, the settle, whether a settlement is accepted. That's for the client. All right. Um, the parties cannot contract for the lawyer to represent both sides who are adverse to each other in a litigation. Even if the parties <coughs> agree, they can't do it. But that's sort of a shallow and cheating way to answer the question. The real way to answer the question, I think, is this. To understand what the lawyer-client relationship is, you also have to understand what the role of that relationship is in the broader legal system. And the role of the lawyer-client relationship in the broader legal system is actually to help establish the rule of law and the authority of the law. We have a technical legal system that's necessary. That means that ordinary people don't understand it. And ordinary people don't frame their legal claims in legal terms. So somebody has to translate what the ordinary people wish to do or think they're entitled to into legal terms. That person has got to be loyal to the client. If that person judges the client <coughs> rather than serving the client, then that person will be alienated from the client. And the client will experience that person not as a bridge between herself and the state, but just as the state. And when the, when the client meets the state without assistance, the state seems less legitimate. Now, the reason I'm going into this, and you should come back because I think you're not satisfied with what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, I understand, so come back, let me finish it, but then the reason I'm going into this is that in, in 
in order to know whether the lawyer-client relationship is fiduciary, you have to know what's the social purpose of that relationship. If the social purpose of that relationship is to help establish the authority of the law, it turns out that it can do that only if it's fiduciary. And that's how you know that the relationship is fiduciary rather than contractual. But try, you know. So the question was, which wasn't described here. Una buena manera indirecta de saber cuándo una obligación es fiduciaria es si plantea el problema de conflicto de interés. Donde hay conflictos de interés, usualmente, casi necesariamente, la, obligación, la relación es fiduciaria. El conflicto, ¿por, qué? Porque, ¿Por qué se plantea el conflicto de interés? Precisamente porque la relación tiene que poster. Es una relación que tiene ese elemento, llamémoslo así, de gratuidad o de... O de ¿Cómo lo llamé yo antes que se me olvidó? ¿Ah? De altruismo. Y eso es precisamente lo que se exige. Segundo, yo no sé si Dan estará de acuerdo conmigo en esto. Uno puede pensar que, una, que un contrato es sale contract. Usually, a sale. A sale contract. A sale contract is usually, usually is a commercial contract. It has no fiduciary elements. But when I go to a specialist to ask for, for you know, a you, you know, which I have, I want to, to, <laughs> to give, to, to give when, I, when, when I want to give a gift to my, to my wife. And uh, the, I ask the, 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 the expert, what kind of you is this? There is a kind of you user relationship because I am not in the same position to this, uh, as, 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 as the expert. You know, so that you, we, we cannot define fiduciary abstract, abstractly. It, which relationships are necessary fiduciary, which are necessary contractual. You, I think there is, you know, a vacuum. There is a vacuum in which a kind of relation as a sort can be a, 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 a contractual relationship and can have a fiduciary element. And that fiduciary element if which in this civil law is uh, fulfilled by good faith. By good faith. In that so, right. so, so, so may, I, may I take that example, which is a very helpful example. Uh, there's a case called Whites Against Park Bernay Galleries, mm -hmm. which is a case in which somebody bought a painting allegedly <coughs> by Raoul Dufy. Yeah. And it turned out not to be by Raoul Dufy. And the reason it's interesting as a case is the following. The gallery that sold the painting identified it as a Raoul Dufy painting, but also included in the text of its catalog and in the text of its contract. We report the provenance of paintings and authorship to the best of our belief and make no guarantees. Mm. Okay? Now, here's the interesting thing about this case. The gallery is trying to have it both ways. Mm -hmm. It may not be trying to do anything underhanded. It, it's, there's no allegation in this case of fraud anywhere. Rather, the gallery functions as it does because it is trusted by people who buy from it. But it wants to limit that trust. And 
some of the courts that see this fact pattern in the U.S. side with the buyer and some of them side with the gallery. But the important thing to see about this is, is that this is a structural feature of the relationship. When you go to an expert, one of the things that you want is the benefit of the expert's expertise. <coughs> and you want the expert to put her expertise to use for you, not for her. And when you, she does that, she assumes a duty to act in your interests, not just based on your intentions. So there's a fiduciary element in the relationship. And it's an interesting question whether she can relieve herself of those duties by telling you that she's not acting as your fiduciary. And the reason it's interesting is it shows you something structural about the relationship. The answer is actually she can't. And it's not that she can't because the law won't let her. It's that she can't because as soon as she tries to, the more effective she is at it, the less valuable she'll become to you. And you know, the difference, what's, what's a fiduciary who, a fiduciary expert who rejects all fiduciary do duties? A swindler, <laughs> <coughs> okay? And you don't want to deal with a swindler. And this is in the structure of the relationship. Yeah, I agree. All right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say there's a normative question too, which is, this relationship is set up to serve certain interests of you and the society. And when you understand those interests, you understand that there is an ineliminable fiduciary component. And that's why even the common law, which says loud and clear a thousand times a day, there is no duty of good faith in negotiations. When you see a case like this, it turns out there is a duty of good faith in negotiations. And it's very hard to, to wait. <laughs> about that uh, last example of the gallery, I just uh, remember uh, about the, the parking situation in the store. When you go to a store and uh, oh, yeah. you park your car, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> well, years ago the, the stores uh, had uh, Sign. signs clean, and right? say uh, we are not responsible mm -hmm. for the damage uh, on your car. And that is, I think, not, not longer accepted here in, in, in Chile. Yeah, uh, my question was about uh, the consumer law. Uh, you said that in Germany, the, the trend is to uh, make more a contractual uh, relation where uh, the, the uh, park, park parties in, in, right. the, in this uh, trade uh, act like just uh, as equal, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, free uh, mm -hmm. contractual parties. Uh, I, I want to ask you, what do you think about uh, the consumer law in Chile? Uh, Things like uh, the uh, national service to the consumer and, and other changes, in, in especially when it comes uh, to persons uh, in relation with a firm like a retailer or, mm. or, or something like that. Uh, what, what would you say about the, the, the tendency, the, the trend? Uh, is it more, uh, is, is it uh, changing more like a fiduciary relation or, or just like a contract? You know, I think there are two different questions in the consumer law. The first is, is the first historically as in Germany, it has to do with the general condition of, con of, of contracts, which are established by the by the by the provider. And in this sense, uh, I think uh, now in in Chilean law, the result, especially of going in that. Uh, Article 16H of the of the Consumer Law Act is that really my 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 conclusion now is that <coughs> really there is no much contractual element, no many contractual elements in the in the consumer relationships in Chile now. That it that what does does it mean? It means that the provider has not the capability to offer modifications of the dispositive roles, the legal roles, in in, in in disadvantage of the for of the of, of the of the consumer. That has caused some costs economically. Mm -hmm. Because uh, some people could be, for example, be interested in 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 uh, in, in acquiring to uh, another thing without a guarantee. At a lower price, you know. Yeah. But the general, the, but but 
the consumer law is cons is, 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 is thought <coughs> from the perspective of, you know, a paternalistic, a material, a paternalistic uh, 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 view of the of the relationship. And um, and secondly, I think there are many <coughs> other provisions in the consumer law which are how to say are fulfilling the gaps of all of the civil law. For example, in in, 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 the, in the in the liability for defective products. In other in other in other legal system, this liability has been ruled outside the consumer law uh, uh, act, mm -hmm. and the consumer law has some 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 institutions in this direction. And thirdly, I think the 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 the, the big advantage of the consumer law, in contrast with the traditional civil law, I mean, I, you know, I think that the consumer law belongs to the civil law. To, uh, to the law of contract, and we have to, we cannot, we cannot understand now the law of contract without including the law protecting consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, the, I think the the other question, the other, the other, the other, the other, the other, the other advantage has, uh, which has introduced the for the consumer, the, the consumer act is the collective acts are the collective actions. Collective actions are not. A general procedure in in, in right. Chilean procedure, right. Right. but in consumer law has been introduced, right. and, and I think it's extremely effective. Can be, yeah. uh, can be, mm -hmm. extremely effective. Could I say something about the parking garage case, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a very good illustration? Let's contrast that case with the art gallery case. In the parking garage case, there are two issues. One is is the disclaimer of liability sufficiently clear and conspicuous? Mm -hmm that the person who parked her car should be charged with knowing about it. Mm -hmm. The other is, if it is sufficiently clear and conspicuous, should it be effective? That is. All right? Now, on the second issue, it's a very different case from the art gallery case in the following way. If I'm parking my car on your property, it's perfectly sensible for me to think, I want to park it on your property, I can look around as well as you can, and I don't care about your expertise about whether your property is secure or not. And so if you tell me you don't guarantee anything about it, it's just look at it, park the car or not, th there's nothing inconsistent in what you're doing. You're not trying to both profit from my trust in you and avoid liability for my trust in you. Mm -hmm. Because that's not our relationship. I'm there, you're not, I can tell as well as you can. Whereas in the art gallery case, if you say it's a painting by Raoul Dufy, and you say, I'm not warranting it's by Raoul Dufy, what you're trying to do is profit from my trust in you and disclaim my trust in you at the same time. And that's because in the art gallery case, but not in the parking lot case, you're an expert, and I'm not. And that structures our relationship. Whereas in the parking lot case, it's not true. Now, what is true, for example, imagine that the sign said, I don't accept liability, including for my intentionally tortious conduct with respect to your car. All right, so even if I go with a baseball bat and bash <coughs> your car in, you have no recourse against it. Well, that would seem odd, and actually in the US and in every other legal system I know of, that kind of a disclaimer would not be effective. Mm. You can't disclaim liability for intentional torts. Why? Because with respect to the intentional tort, you are an expert in whether or not you're going to commit an intentional <laughs> tort with respect to me. And I trust in that, just as I trust in, your, in the art gallery. That, that's the structure, and this goes back to the first. That's why the art gallery case is going to be like fiduciary, and the parking lot case doesn't need to be as, luna, as long as the warning is conspicuous and clear. Uh, and <laughs> at this point, I can only speak in Catalan. The theme, I think, is to return to our language, yo creo que hay un problema con las condiciones de, de contratación que son uno es si hay consentimiento o no hay consentimiento si se puede imputar consentimiento para que pueda imputarse consentimiento tiene que ser tienen que ser conocidas la segunda es si es, incluso aceptando consentimiento si se puede considerar que son abusivas porque de acuerdo yo creo que ahí es donde entra la, la, la the behavioral economics no es mm -hmm. cierto de acuerdo con la moderna economía, yo creo que aquí el, el cambio de paradigma más fuerte 
es de, del modelo neoclásico, del, del, del sujeto económico neoclásico hacia, el, hacia la behavioral economics. En la economía del comportamiento lo que ocurre es que en la economía neoclásica tú tendrías, o sea, de acuerdo con la teoría de la voluntad, cada cual tiene que preocuparse de leer todas las letras chicas. Y entrar o no entrar al, al, al estacionamiento valorando los riesgos que tiene entrar a un estacionamiento en el cual el propietario no responde. Pero la verdad es que uno entra a un estacionamiento de un supermercado pensando que el, 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 el supermercadista va a cuidar del, 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 del establecimiento. Y si establece una regla de que no cuida, va tan fuerte contra las expectativas naturales que tiene el consumidor que resulta que se considera que es abusiva la vida. Por eso te digo que en general, las condiciones generales de contratación, el efecto que tienen, las reglas sobre condiciones generales de contratación, significan, en el fondo, que el derecho de dispositivo se transforma en imperativo. Bueno, es decir, aquello que en, en la teoría del contrato puede ser cambiado voluntariamente por las partes, en definitiva no puede ser. Y ese es un cambio verdaderamente muy importante, yo creo que tiene que ver con un cambio del concepto de sujeto, que en economía se produce por el paso desde la, escuela neo, desde, desde, desde la concepción maximizadora del sujeto de la escuela neoclásica hacia el sujeto de carne y hueso que tiene sus pasiones y tiene su urgencia que eh, está definido por la vigencia de la economía. Profesor Rojas. Gracias por la presentación. Uh, first, I, I want to ask Professor Markovitz regarding the state of the, of the, boiler, the boilerplate uh, clauses in consumer contracts. Uh, as I understand, uh, the good faith uh, obligations of providers of service, of good and services are, are not as, ex as extensive as the duty of, 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 of not the duty, as the obligations under good faith that we recognize under civil law countries, uh, uh, duty of cooperation of the things that, that you were talking before. But and, and I understand there's a proposition by Professor Radian, Margaret mm -hmm. Dean Radian, mm -hmm. that we should rec uh, recurs to torts mm -hmm. to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. To because in torts you could um, you could find this good faith in civil law way. Right. Uh, that you do, don't, right. do not find in in right. contracts right. under the the, yeah. the common law. So, right. my question is, in, in a more abstract way, is where it starts in this structure? Yeah. Um, so, uh, in an abstract way, mm -hmm. uh, I, torts is out of this structure mm -hmm. for the following reason. Um, at least on the contract side, mm -hmm. contract is voluntary obligation. And it's voluntary in the following sense. It's not just voluntary in that it's caused by the intentions of the parties. A tort obligation can be like that. When I sit down behind the wheel of my car and turn on the ignition, I've now acquired an obligation not to be drunk. All right, I caused that obligation to come into existence. But I didn't, the obligation is not directly a creature of my intentions. Rather, I have a gene generic obligation not unreasonably to risk harming other people. Mm -hmm. And that generic obligation becomes an obligation specifically not to be drunk when I start driving the car. Contract is different. It's a, simply a creature of the intentions of the parties. The parties bring it into existence directly, unmediatedly. All right? Fiduciary duty is not quite like that because the parties create the fiduciary relationship intentionally. But their intentions don't constitute that relationship because it's constituted by the law in various ways. And that's the difference. And one way you might think of this is as adding a set of tort-like norms in the background of intentional relations. Incidentally, a historical set of cases like this in common law are cases involving common carriers. So railroads, inns, others were obligated by law at common law to take all paying customers. And they were then subject to a set of duties mm -hmm. and a set of remedies, including disgorgement-style remedies, mm -hmm. that mere contractual partners were not precisely for this reason. So that's, in, at the most abstract level, that's probably where torque comes in. Mm -hmm. But more concretely, on the boilerplate point, uh, I'm not sure what I think of Peggy's suggestion for the following reasons. 
we don't understand how boilerplate works. Okay? Um, here is a fact pattern that actually exists in the world. I've tried it out myself just to confirm that it exists. Contracts deprive consumers of certain rights in boilerplate. And then consumers who wish to assert the rights that the boilerplate deprived them of are in fact given the benefits of those rights by the retailers if the retailers believe the consumers are acting in good faith. So very concretely, um, you know, if, if in the US you have a credit card and you almost always pay it on time, and one day you pay it a day late and a late fee is assessed, if you call up your credit card company and say, I'm terribly sorry, I was traveling, I didn't get the bill in time, could you waive the late fee? Their answer is yes. Even though the fine print gives them the right to assert the late fee. Retailers often in the fine print say, we won't accept the return or exchange if the item has been used or tried on. But if you go back to the store in the United States with the item and say, look, I'm terribly sorry, it didn't look right, they'll exchange it for you, even though they assert the right not to exchange it for you. Mm -hmm. Why am I saying this? Well, what boilerplate does is it transfers the contractual negotiation from the beginning of the relationship <coughs> and into a dispute resolution process within the relationship. And in order to understand how boilerplate works, we have to understand how customer complaints divisions work. And there's been virtually no empirical research done on this. There's an ad hoc study by Bob Kagan at Berkeley in which he had his students see how 20 local customer complaints divisions work. And roughly speaking, 10 of them worked by always saying no to the customer and relying on boilerplate. And roughly speaking, 10 of them worked by trying in good faith to resolve the dispute. If it turns out that lots of customer complaints divisions try in good faith to resolve the dispute, then boilerplate is a very different thing from if it's just a way of tricking customers, right? And if that's a realistic possibility, then another response to boilerplate is not to tortify it, but to say what boilerplate does, in fact, is it establishes within the already existing contractual relationship a kind of duty of good faith in negotiations between the retailer, in this case, and the customer, that the retailer must engage in good faith efforts to remedy the customer's and what the boilerplate does, it is allows the retailer to avoid that in cases in which the retailer believes that the customer is acting in bad faith. Because after all, customers can act in bad faith too. Just to give you an example from my high school days, the Gap, is there, does the Gap yeah. sell in Chile? Yeah. Well, so when I was a boy in Texas, the Gap had a policy that it would accept returns of its clothes, always, forever, no matter how much they'd been worn. And I had a friend who worked at the Gap in a mall in Austin, Texas. And there was a woman who every three months exchanged her entire wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> and the policy required the gap simply to, you know, she would wear the clothes, and then the next season would come in and she'd get all new clothes and she never had to buy clothes. <laughs> all right? Now, one reason a firm might put boilerplate in contracts <laughs> is to give it draconian rights when confronted with a customer like that. And, and we don't actually know what the balance is of what the firms are doing. And that's why I think the tortification idea might be premature. It might not. <laughs> No, si provienen de la misma de la misma tradición, de la misma tradición. Lo que pasa es que en el derecho chileno tú sabes que fueron en, en la impropiedad fiduciaria está prácticamente eh, o está muy limitada por el hecho de la del plazo de los cinco años o de, la, o de la condición de la muerte, ¿no? Pero en esencia, digamos, las obligaciones del propietario fiduciario son las de trustee. Lo que pasa es que en Estados Unidos normalmente por la práctica contractual particularmente los trusts están sujetos a un estatuto de trust que es mucho más complejo 
y que arregla las relaciones del trustee con el beneficiario, con el fundador y todo lo demás, muchísimo más estricto. Por eso en Chile se desapareció la idea de propiedad fiduciaria, pero en su origen es lo mismo, exactamente tiene el mismo principio y el mismo principio romano. Por lo menos. Gracias, Concluimos esta jornada eh, agradeciendo la convocatoria y la interesante presentación realizada por ambos profesores. También agradecemos nuevamente a nuestros oficiadores, a Julián Pinto Abogado, y al Departamento de Derecho Privado de la Facultad de Derecho de la Universidad de Chile. También invitamos a todos los asistentes a seguir al Congreso, eh, al Congreso Estudiantil de Derecho Civil por las redes sociales para que puedan estar al tanto de las futuras actividades y convocatorias. Finalmente, a quienes gusten, los invitamos a, a tomar un café. Eh, muchas gracias y buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Thank you. 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 Thank you.